welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of Lectures on Ancient Philosophy Written by Manley P. Hall Chapter 10 Pagan Theogony and Cosmogony from the Greek mythology that had its genesis in the revelations of Orpheus and its efflorescence in the erudition of Plato, the Neoplatonists extracted a sublime philosophy. In his introduction to the six books of Proclus on the theology of Plato, Thomas Taylor writes, According to this theology, therefore, from the immense principle of principles, in which all things casually subsist, absorbed in superessential light and involved in unfathomable depths, a beauteous progeny of principles proceed, all largely partaking of the ineffable, all stamped with the occult characters of deity, all possessing an overflowing fullness of good. From these dazzling summits, these ineffable blossoms, these divine propagations, being, life, intellect, soul, nature and body depend, monad suspended from unities, deified natures proceeding from deities. Each of these monads, too, is the leader of a series which extends from itself to the last of things and which while it proceeds from, at the same time abides in and returns to its leader. And all these principles and all their progeny are finally centered and rooted by their summits in the first great all-comprehending one. Thus, all beings proceed from and are comprehended in the first being, all intellects emanate from one first intellect, all souls from one first soul, all natures blossom from one first nature, and all bodies proceed from the vital and luminous body of the world. And lastly, all these great monads are comprehended in the first one, from which both they and all their depending series are unfolded into light. Hence, this first one is truly the unity of unities, the monad of monads, the principle of principles, the God of gods, one and all things and yet one prior the concluding sentence of the quotation establishes beyond all cavil the monotheistic foundation of Greek philosophy. In fact, to the discerning it is basically a philosophic atheism, for this supreme deity actually is neither a personality nor a principle, but the principle of principles, the most abstract of the most abstract, so universalized and unlimited in its inherent nature as to be incomprehensible. When such a deity is compared with the popular theological concept of a personal god, the supremacy of philosophy's god is at once apparent. The god of ancient philosophy is the deity whose sufficiency will yet be vindicated by modern science. Men will never outgrow the god of Plato but one by one the gods of creeds and sects will be driven from their thrones by the unfolding intellect of man. The modern world already demands the abdication of that despotic regent who has ruled the universe for the past few thousand years. The foregoing quotation also reveals how from this first and perfect unity infinite diversity proceeds in sequential order. Simple monotheism thus manifests through a complex polytheism and the gods are demonstrated as philosophically necessary to the orderly workings of the divine plan. On the subject of the gods proceeding from the nature of simple unity, Thomas Taylor further writes. For if whatever possesses a power of generating, generates similars prior to dissimilars, every cause must deliver its own form and characteristic peculiarity to its progeny and before it generates that which gives subsistence to progressions far distant and separate from its nature, it must constitute things proximate to itself according to essence and conjoined with it through similitude. It is therefore, necessary from these premises, 
since there is one unity the principle of the universe, that this unity should produce from itself, prior to everything else, a multitude of natures characterized by unity and a number the most of all things allied to its cause, and these natures are no other than the gods. The principle of emanationism as unfolded in the Orphic Theogony became the vital doctrine of the Gnostics, who conceived a spiritual hierarchy as occupying each degree of the interval between the extremes of first cause and nature. The seven grand divisions into which existence is divided are termed in Neoplatonism, 1, the principle of principles, which is inscrutable and analogous to the threefold darkness of the Egyptians, 2, being, the first point of the triad of cause, 3, life, 4, intellect, which completes the triad of causes, 5, soul, which is the apex of the triad of generation, 6, nature, and, 7, body, which completes the triad of generation. Thus, is revealed the order by which cause flows into generation and eventually produces bodies, the latter being objectifications in matter of superphysical paradigms or archetypes. As certain monadic forces are thus, suspended from a supreme unity, so this design of diversity suspended from unity is an invariable pattern throughout creation. Each item of diversity then becomes in its own nature a unity, from which is further suspended another chain of diversity and so on ad infinitum. For example, from the immense principle of principles as the supreme monad are suspended the divine principles of being, life, intellect, soul, nature and body. Each of these becomes, in turn, a monadic unit. From being are suspended beings, from life, lives, from intellect, intellects, from soul, souls, from nature, natures, and from body, bodies. It naturally follows that all bodies partake of the qualities of the principle of body and are manifestations of it, all souls partake of the principle of soul, and all beings partake of the principle of being. The principle of body exists throughout all the chain of emanations intervening between its primal manifestation from the absolute and such bodies as stones and trees which exist temporarily in this ephemeral sphere. There are divine bodies, luminous and splendid, there are immortal bodies, transcendent in power, and there are mortal bodies, subject to continual evil and decay. The greater the interval between the principle of body and the subordinate body suspended from that principle, the lower the quality and organization of that body. The world as a body and the worm as a body are both suspended from the principle of body, the worm, however, is suspended from a monad far more remote from the principle of body than is the world, for the worm, being part of the life of the world is a minute part of the diversity from one of the countless monads suspended from the body of the world itself. Herein is revealed the mystery of Adam, for as Philo Judeus affirms, Adam is actually the monad of mankind. Human beings therefore, derive their human qualities from their participation in the nature of this prototypic monad. Thus, from the Adamic monad are suspended the hundreds of millions of individualized men and women who, when considered as a unit, constitute a single male and female creature, the first and supreme man, the idea of mankind, the Adamic unity. The Theogony of Orpheus as set forth by Hesiod and interpreted by Proclus is divisible into three major parts, of which the first, in the words of Rev. James Davies, is concerned with cosmogony, or the creation of the world, its powers and its fabric. The second part, or theogony proper, is concerned with the generations of the gods and records the histories of the dynasties of Cronus and Zeus. The third part is concerned in a fragmentary way with the generation of heroes, who sprang from the intercourse of mortals with immortals. Both space and the purposes of this chapter limit us to a consideration of the first, or cosmological, division, together with a brief outline of the generation of Cronus and the rebellion of the Titans. In the beginning, declare the Orphic fragments, was the absolute, unborn, unaging and undying time. 
Here time is conceived to be in a state of suspension, for as time depends for its reality upon the succession of incidents, it cannot exist actively until the establishment of the worlds. Time is the perfect wholeness which encompasses all manifestations as a mysterious intangible envelope. Within the divine sphere of time existences live and move and have their being. From this inscrutable wholeness there issue forth two agents designated ether and chaos, or the bound and the infinity. Thus, in the terms of the ancient symbolism, the one becomes the two. The first of these agents ether is called the bound because as a symbol of primordial activity it is limited as to place, condition and duration. Chaos, which in some systems of cosmogony is elevated to the position of first deity, takes second place, when compared to the enduring wholeness. Being unlimited, unorganized and without sense of time, it is properly termed infinity. These two opposites, bound and infinity, acting each upon the other, destroy the placidity of the eternal state. Ether, the active agent, is symbolized as a vast whirlwind which moves the surface of chaos and out of its unorganized substances forms a great ovoid, termed by the ancients the Orphic or Cosmic Egg. This egg is usually represented as encircled by the coils of a great serpent, the ether. The substances of the egg, having been impregnated by the divine ether, increase from within outward. The fertilized egg expands and finally bursts asunder to reveal the triple dragon god Fans, who is called the divine or absolute animal. Fans is described as an incorporeal god, bearing golden wings on his shoulders, but in his inward parts naturally possessing the heads of bulls, upon which heads a mighty dragon appears, invested with the various forms of wild beasts. The point is also repeatedly emphasized that Fans, while possessing wings and a human head, is without a body, his entire being consisting of a vast ring of radiant effulgence. The ancient commentaries, especially those of the Neoplatonists, identify fans with the cherubim of Ezekiel and the composite monster of the Chaldaic Egyptian mysteries. The bull's head signify the constellation of Taurus, the lion's head, which fans is sometimes said to have, is the constellation of Leo, the dragon is the constellation of Scorpio, and the human head with wings upon its neck is the constellation of the god-man, Aquarius. Thus, the four hierarchies called the lords of generation are set forth. In the Christian system these animals and winged creatures are ascribed to the four evangelists to indicate that the Gospels are the source of spiritual life. The specially emphasized fact that the head of fans is without a body reminds the disciple that the lower or bodily universe has not yet become objectified, but remains as an unapplied idea of the first deity. Several early mythologists divided the egg of cosmos into an upper and a lower hemisphere, the upper composed of gold and the lower of silver. Similarly, in the images of Zeus the eyes are sometimes inlaid with silver to indicate his sovereignty over the inferior, or lower, hemisphere of creation. It is also stated that after breaking open to release the radiant fans, the upper part of the universal egg became the intellectual universe and the lower part the sensible universe. This is paralleled in the story of creation according to Genesis, where it is related that the waters which were above the heavens were divided from the waters which were below the firmament. The interval between the two sundered hemispheres of the egg was called heaven and here the light of fans was diffused throughout the elements of the intelligible sphere. It is most significant that heaven should be located between the extremes of intellect and sense, since its correlate in the body, the heart is situated between the intellectual nature above and the animal nature below. Fans is referred to as the triple god because he is a triad of powers, with himself as the principal, or monad and Erechopeus and Metis as his lesser aspects. As fans represent spiritual light and life, it is natural that his consort, or Sakti, should represent spiritual darkness, or the medium through which this light manifests. The mother of the gods was therefore, 
called Threefold Night and she alone mingled in perfect union with Fans, who is described as giving to her his scepter that she might in queenly manner rule his world. By right of her threefold powers Night brought forth two children, the first of her progeny, called Heaven and Earth. The latter is to be understood as a divine cosmic earth and not the terrestrial globe with which we are familiar. One of the chief sources of confusion in the study of ancient systems of cosmogony arises from the effort to relate such terms as earth and world to our own physical system, when in reality they refer to invisible superphysical spheres, the archetypes of the inferior generations which are to follow. The heaven and earth born of the union of night and fans are the spheres of the noumenon and phenomenon which form such essential elements in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Heaven and earth are then united in marriage and in the words of G. R. S. Amid, from their union arises a strange and curious progeny, the fates, Parsi, hundred-handed, Sentimani, and they who see around, Cyclopes. The fates are the karmic powers, which adjust all things according to the causes of prior universe, while the Sentimani and Cyclopes are the guilders, or rather the overseers or noetic architects, who supervise the builders of the sensible universe. These were the first progeny of heaven and earth and were cast down to Tartarus, for they worked within all things and so, as evolution proceeded, permeated every kingdom of nature. But then, without the knowledge of heaven, earth brought forth, says Orpheus, Proc, Tim, Hi. 137, Seven fair daughters, bright-eyed, pure and seven princely sons, covered with hair, and these are called the avengers of their brethren. And the names of the daughters are Themis and Tethys, Mnemosyne and Thea, Dion and Phoebe and Rhea, and of the sons, Seus and Crius, Phorsus and Cronus, Oceanus and Hyperion and Lepidus, Proc, Opat, V.295. And these are the Titans, Secretary Orpheus. Under the leadership of Cronus all the Titans save Oceanus rebelled against heaven and established the material sphere. Cronus became the ruler of the Titans, which position he held until Zeus, leading his giants, overthrew the empire of Cronus and established the physical universe. We are told in the commentaries that the last of the heavenly line is Bacchus, in whom the generations of Uranus, or heaven, are complete. In the Orphic Theogony then follows the order of the supermundane and mundane gods, with accounts of the heroes and those who were elevated to a parody with divinity because of the immortal spirit that led them to the pinnacle of achievement. This sublime philosophy, which clothes cosmic processes in personalities and reveals by their combinations the wonders of the intelligible sphere, has been debased to the point where it is now regarded as merely a collection of myths suitable only for the amusement of the adolescent and the dotard, or to furnish poets with the inspiration for a bare existence. Perpetuated thus, in all its outer form in Bullfinch's Age of Fable, the theology by which Plato lived and died is now looked upon as something outlived or as having overshot the mark. The Orphics, however, thought truly and wrote well. Their theology cannot die, but shall survive every device created to destroy it and in a more philosophic era in the future shall shine forth again with splendor undiminished. It is now established beyond reasonable doubt that the Vedic writings of the Hindus were the chief contributions to the exalted structure of Orphic theogony. It is even asserted that the first Orpheus was a Hindu. A number of early Greek philosophers, moreover, prominent among them Thales and Pythagoras, were initiated into the mysteries of the Brahmins. There is also a legend to the effect that Osiris, the black god of Egypt, journeyed to that land from Asia, establishing in the double empire of the Nile his mysteries patterned after those of the Brahmins. Whether these founders of philosophic systems were actual personalities or personifications of their doctrines cannot be determined definitely at this late period. It is not at all improbable that the journeys presumably taken by such demigods as Orpheus and Osiris arcanely signify the migrations westward of the cults of the primitive Asiatic Aryans. 
When compared with the Oriental creation myths it is evident that the Greek fables appear fragmentary and obscure, for the early Brahmin sages were unquestionably the greatest abstract thinkers whose doctrines have survived to this day. That eminent student of Vedic philosophy, the Honorable H. H. Wilson, in a footnote on Indian mythology and tradition was moved to write, as, however, the Grecian accounts and those of the Egyptians, are much more perplexed and unsatisfactory than those of the Hindus, it is most probable that we find amongst them the doctrine in its most original as well as most methodical and significant form. Having given a brief outline of the Orphic cosmogony, we next turn to the more ancient Brahman theory in order to make possible a comparison between these two philosophic systems. The Vedic creation myth as set forth in the opening chapters of the Vishnu Purana may be summarized as follows. The sage, Parasra, discourses with his disciple, Mithraya, not the Bodhisattva, concerning Vasudeva, the indwelling radiance, and how it came forth to manifest creation. Parasra begins his account with this prayer. Glory to the unchangeable, holy, eternal, supreme Vishnu, of one universal nature, the mighty over all, to him who is Hiranigarbha, Hari and Sankara, the creator, the preserver and destroyer of the world, to Vasudeva, the liberator of his worshippers, to him whose essence is both single and manifold, who is both subtle and corporeal, indiscreet and discreet, to Vishnu, the cause of final emancipation, glory to the supreme Vishnu, the cause of the creation, existence and end of this world, who is the root of the world and who consists of the world. Upon completion of his prayer Parasra enters upon the main theme of his discourse with the declaration that Brahma, the supreme, eternal, unborn, imperishable and undecaying Lord, first exists in the forms of Purusha, spirit, and Kata, time. From Purusha next proceeded two other forms called the discrete and the indiscreet. Thus, primary matter, spirit, visible substance and time, are declared by the wise to be the pure and supreme condition of Vishnu, which is Brahma in the state of quiescence. In his opening prayer Parasra refers to Vishnu, who, in the terms of the Greek Platonists would be the power, or second person of the Brahmanic triad and consequently its active part, as Hiranigarbha, meaning the Brahma who is born from the golden egg, Hari, which is Vishnu as the Lord of Goodness, and Sankara, or Shiva, the destroyer. Taking upon himself the capacity of Brahma, Vishnu becomes the creator, assuming the nature of Shiva, or Rudra, he is the destroyer, and in his true nature as Vishnu he is in equilibrium between them. In a footnote to the description of the four elements composing the nature of Vishnu, Professor Wilson states that the Purusha, or spirit of the Hindus, is analogous to the fans of the Orphics, pradana or primary matter, to the Orphic chaos, and kala, or time, to the Orphic chronos. As fans consisted of a triad of powers, so pradana is declared to be endowed with three qualities in equilibrium and to be the mother of the world. Therefore, it is written, there was neither day nor night, nor sky nor earth, nor darkness nor light, nor any other thing, save only one, inapprehensible by intellect, or that which is Brahma and Puman, spirit, and Fadana, matter. It is then written that the supreme Brahma of his own will enters into spirit and matter and the season of creation having arrived, agitates the mutable and immutable principles. This is accomplished in an occult manner. As fragrance affects the mind from its proximity merely and not from any immediate operation upon mind itself, so the supreme influence the elements of creation. From these equilibrated qualities proceeds the unequal development of these qualities, which is termed the principal mahat or intellect. The creator then invents the great principal intellect, which is termed aswara, the manifested creator. Mahat then becomes threefold and its phases are termed the threefold egotism. The Vishnu Purana continues, elementary egotism then becoming productive, as the rudiment of sound, produced from it ether, 
of which sound is the characteristic, investing it with its rudiment of sound. Ether becoming productive, engendered the rudiments of touch, when originated strong wind, the property of which is touch, and ether, with the rudiment of sound, enveloped the rudiment of touch. Then wind becoming productive, produced the rudiment of form, color, when light, or fire, proceeded, of which, form, color, is the attribute, and the rudiment of touch enveloped the wind with the rudiment of color. Light becoming productive, produced the rudiment of taste, whence proceed all juices in which flavor resides, and the rudiment of color invested the juices with the rudiment of taste. The waters becoming productive, engendered the rudiments of smell, whence an aggregate, earth, originates, of which smell is the property. When the rudiments had united themselves with the properties here described they assumed the character of one mass which, directed by spirit and with the acquiescence of the indiscreet principle, intellect and the rest, formed an egg which gradually expanded like a bubble of water. This vast egg, sage, compounded of the elements and resting on the waters, was the excellent natural abode of Vishnu in the form of Brahma, and their Vishnu, the lord of the universe, whose essence is inscrutable, assumed a perceptible form and even he himself abided in it in the character of Brahma. Its womb, vast as the mountain Meru, was composed of the mountains, and the mighty oceans were the waters that filled its cavity. In that egg, O Brahman, were the continents and seas and mountains, the planets and divisions of the universe, the gods, the demons and mankind. And this egg was externally invested by seven natural envelopes, or by water, air, fire, ether, and a hankara, the origin of the elements, each tenfold the extent of that which it invested, next came the principle of intelligence, and finally, the whole was surrounded by the indiscreet principle, resembling thus, the coconut, filled interiorly with pulp and exteriorly covered by husk and rind. Vishnu as the principle of immeasurable power and the quality of goodness preserves these creations through successive ages until the end of a kalpa, or period. Then he assumes the form of Rudra and swallows up the universe. Having thus, devoured all things and converted the world into one vast ocean, the Supreme reposes upon his mighty serpent couch amidst the deep, he awakes after a season and again, as Brahma becomes the author of creation. Thus, the one only God, Janardana, the object of mortal adoration, takes the designation of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, accordingly as he creates, preserves, or destroys. Vishnu as creator, creates himself, as preserver, preserves himself, as destroyer, destroys himself at the end of all things. The Kulpa, or day of Brahma, is the period of manifestation of a creation and at the end thereof the Mighty One retires into himself for an equal period, after which he comes forth again in a new creation. From the method employed to calculate time in the Vishnu Purana, figures are obtained which are overwhelming in their magnitude. For example, each year of human reckoning is divided into two parts to signify the six-month periods during which the sun is north and south of the equator. These periods are called respectively a day and a night of the gods. Twelve thousand divine years, each year consisting of three hundred and sixty such days of the gods, constitute a great age, or aggregate of four lesser ages called yugas, by which the activity of the world is measured. A thousand of these great ages are termed a day of Brahma and fourteen lords, or Manus, rule over this vast period. Professor Wilson estimates a kulpa to be four billion three hundred and twenty million years, or the great day of Brahma. The life of Brahma consists of one hundred years made up of such great days, or one hundred and fifty-five trillion five hundred and twenty billion mortal years. The last great kulpa, which is called Padma, or the Lotus, closed the first half of Brahma's existence. The present Kulpa, which is called the Varha, or Bor, Kulpa, ushers in the second half of Brahma's life. Parasra then describes how at the beginning of the present Kulpa, 
Narayana, he who moves upon the waters, brought forth the earth and re-established the generations. It should he borne in mind that the beginning of a kalpa is the reawakening of Brahma from his night of rest and is not a complete creation, for things already exist in a suspended state, in which condition they have remained through the sleep of the gods. At the beginning of a kalpa, therefore, the creation is in reality a reorganization of already existing elements. It is written, at the close of the past, or Padma, Kulpa, the divine Brahma, endowed with the quality of goodness, awoke from his night of sleep and beheld the universe void. Realizing the earth, in the sense of cosmos, to be concealed in the depths of the great waters, Brahma assumed the figure of a huge boar, as in previous kalpas he had taken upon himself other forms. Thus, embodied he plunged into the great ocean. The earth, beholding his approach to restore her to her ancient dignity, recited a hymn in his honor in which she glorified his powers. The mighty boar, pleased with the chanting, emitted a low murmuring sound and then lifted upon his ample tusks the globe of the world. Filled with delight at beholding the trembling boar as he rose up dripping with moisture, the sages residing continually in the sphere of the saints sang praises to the stern-eyed upholder of the universe after this fashion. Triumph, Lord of Lord Supreme, Kesva, Sovereign of the Earth, the wielder of the mace, the shell, the discus and the sword, cause of production, destruction and existence. Thou art, O God, there is no other supreme condition, but Thou. Thou, Lord, art the person of sacrifice, for Thy feet are the Vedas, Thy tusks are the stake to which the victim is bound, in Thy teeth are the offerings, Thy mouth is the altar, Thy tongue is the fire, and the hairs of Thy body are the sacrificial grass. Thine eyes, O Omnipotent, are day and night, Thy head is the seat of all, the place of Brahma, Thy name is all the hymns of the Vedas, Thy nostrils are all oblations, O Thou, whose snout is the ladle of oblation, whose deep voice is the chanting of the Samaveda, whose body is the hall of sacrifice, whose joints are the different ceremonies, and whose ears have the properties of both voluntary and obligatory rites, do Thou, who art eternal, who art in size a mountain, be propitious. Quickly raising up the world the great boar placed it on the summit of Dai Ocean, where it floats like a mighty vessel sustained by its expansive surface. Then he who never wills in vain divided the world into portions, seven in number, the plains. He likewise created the spheres of the elements and the worlds of the immortals and prepared for the coming of organized life which was to blossom forth again spontaneously after the pralaya, or sleep of the great night. From this point Brahma concerns himself with the orders of mundane life and the re-establishment of his faith and order among men. Those who desire complete details of the story are referred to the Vishnu Purana as translated from the original Sanskrit by H. H. Wilson, or the Vishnu Puranam in prose English translation by Manmuth Nath Dutt. Whereas the Greek and Brahman creation myths are comparatively well known to scholars, the subjects of Chinese cosmogony and theogony have received little or no consideration in the Western world. Hence in the study of comparative cosmologies we may consider with profit the Chinese doctrine concerning the origin and procession of the worlds. For such purpose no more ancient or venerable authority can be found in Chinese literature than the Yiking, or the classic of change, which is devoted to an interpretation of the trigrams of Fahi and which also contains a lengthy commentary by Confucius. Upon approaching this subject the student is surprised at the definite and direct treatment, reminiscent of the Greek style, that pervades the entire scheme. The purity, the simplicity and the dignity of Chinese philosophy are a real joy to the Occidental thinker, as well as a pronounced relief from the involved and rambling procedures of Western cults. By way of introduction, the whole pagan universe is regarded as being alive. Nowhere in it is death to be found, only continual change accompanied always by a certain sense of continual improvement and a hazy, yet intriguing, 
promise of ultimate accomplishment. It is unfortunate that Christian theology could not have perpetuated the magnificent pagan concept of a pulsating, vibrant universe instead of a world in which everything is dead except God in his threefold nature, man, the angelic orders and a motley assortment of devils. In China there is a famous saying, the living heaven and the living earth. The Reverend Canon McClatchy, for twenty-five years a Christian missionary and a student of Chinese philosophy, writes, Our Christian ideas teach us that the heaven above us and the earth beneath our feet, are composed of dead matter, whereas the pagans one and all have ever regarded these as beings endowed with life and informed by a living soul, or mind, as they generally designated, which rules and governs the world just as the soul does the human body. Western theology ostensibly postulates the earth as simply a mass of inert substance slipped in under a falling humanity to prevent it from dropping through space indefinitely. Not so long ago theologians viewed heaven as a great dome with the constellations suspended like elaborate chandeliers from its inner surface. These lights owing their existence presumably to the fact that divinity trusted creation so little that he feared to leave his children alone in the dark. Somewhere also in this most substantial vault was a ventilator or skylight which could be opened to permit the descent of the New Jerusalem suspended on four cables and a windlass. Invidious comparisons made by Christian writers as between pagan and Christian theologies demonstrate the perennial difficulty of creeds to see the beam in their own eyes. For in no respect is the heaven of theology a worthy substitute for the heaven of pagan philosophy and nowhere among the cultured pagans do we find a concept of the universe so hopelessly inadequate as that assumed by Christendom. To exchange the oppressive atmosphere of an inanimate universe for the sweep of that animate world of the Chinese, is to escape from the prison house of sense into the larger world of mind and spirit. The unsolvable problem for theology is how the Creator could fashion the universe of things out of the vacuum of nothing. Such an achievement must indeed be ascribed to divine ledger domain. Again, if nothing pervaded all eternity, then even the substance of deity itself becomes a legitimate question. According to this theological concept, the Creator is a vast personality with abstract parts and members more or less, who in some unaccountable manner must have issued forth from the very emptiness with which he is enveloped. The element of rationality is nowhere apparent in the theory of a Creator who dwells alone forever in the void of nothingness but who occasionally amuses himself by manifesting mud pies out of this nothingness and then with childish fretfulness resolves them back again into the nothingness from which they came. The asseverations of the Church to the contrary notwithstanding, this primordial nothingness can scarcely be conceived of as a pliable or workable substance, nor can the procession of universes said to issue from this literal vacuum be regarded as other than a miracle which would overtax the capacity of even the deity. And yet the Reverend McClatchy blandly assures us that the biblical student, for example, is aware that one of the most essential and important doctrines taught in the first verse of Genesis is the non-eternity of matter, but, in translating a pagan classic, he should be acquainted with the fact that all heathen systems without exception assert the eternity of matter and that this is one of the most prominent differences between the cosmogony of Moses and that of all pagan writers. If matter is eternal it must necessarily be divine and a god, and hence it is altogether vain and fruitless to expect to find, in heathen materialism, any being whom it is not idolatrous to worship. The eternal duration of matter, here regarded as synonymous with the absolute and in reality man's negative approach to the absolute, is philosophy's answer to this dilemma of a spontaneous creation from nothing as maintained by theology. Modern science agrees with pagan philosophy that there is an ever-existing substance, the nature of which is as yet undefinable but which provides the common seed ground from which grow the myriads of manifesting spheres. When the pagan thus affirmed the existence of an undying substance universal root matter, which after passing through an infinite diversity of modes ultimately returns to its primordial state, 
they established the Wheel of Eternity and founded the doctrine of world transmigration. Far from being nothing this universal root matter was all things and because it was only capable of negative definition was termed no thing. From this eternal matter, not matter as defined by the physicist but rather as the ever-enduring, undifferentiated life, creation comes forth and after manifesting the latent urges inherent in its parts ultimately returns to its primordial state. This philosophic matter, the undefined monad composed of an infinitude of germinal units in abstraction offers both a rational and effective solution to the problem of first cause, thus, leaving the mind free to contemplate the processes by which this first cause fashioned the tangible universe. This hypothesis supplies deity with the substance of his own nature, the origin of his own divinity and the materials with which he is to fabricate cosmos. The supreme god of China, like the first deities of Greece and Egypt, must be this ever-enduring matter to which is applied the term Tien, it is the inner heavens in the sense of quality and the outer heavens in the sense of quantity the universal parent, the infinite capacity, the undifferentiated cause, the ever-flowing fountain. From the nature of this universalized divinity emanated the organized creation by an orderly progression. To begin with, there came forth two principles called heirs, by which this universal essence opposes itself to itself and in the field of this opposition establishes the generations. These two, called heaven and earth, are to be understood as actuating spirit and receptive matter. Their proper names are the Great Father and the Great Mother, which together form a vast anthropomorphic deity whom the Chinese call Shang Ti, or the Sky Emperor, Shang Ti, -e, the heavenly ruler of the celestial empire, is revered through his positive aspect, heaven, and is therefore, termed the emperor of heaven. His descendant upon the earth, the human emperor, is called the son of heaven and rules by right of the authority vested in him by his sky father. In his aspect of heaven, Shang Ti -e consists of a triad which is termed heaven, earth and man. The third member of this trinity is the world emperor who, as a sort of platonic monad, contains within himself all mankind. The elements of the Brahmanic system, primary matter, spirit, visible substance and time, have their parallel in the Chinese Tian, heaven, earth and Puan Ku, which together are termed Shang Ti, -e, the creator. As the great father, heaven, consists of a triad of qualities, so the Great Mother, Earth, also manifests three natures which complement the three principles of the Great Father, resulting in what are called the eight trigrams or figures, of which Keen, the Father, and Quan, the Mother, are the origin. In the Chinese Kabbalah, Keen, the active principle, is symbolized by three unbroken lines and Quan, the receptive principle, by three broken lines. These lines are arranged in six other patterns, called respectively the three sons and three daughters. In the more profound interpretation of this philosophy chaos is the eternal deity or divine matter which causes to exist within itself two heirs, one termed subtle and the other coarse. The subtle heir is spirit and its name is yang, the coarse heir is matter and its name is yin. From the intimate mingling of these two heirs all the phenomena of generation have their origin. In terms of Platonism, these two heirs would be the rational and the irrational souls respectively which, as Confucius declares, are never discoverable separate from each other. It is possible, therefore, to divide diagrammatically the Chinese universe into three spheres corresponding to the three worlds of Pythagoras, i.e., the supreme world, the superior world and the inferior world, all of which exist within the nature of absolute and unchanging matter, which is both the first and the last, the unborn and the undying. Thus, within the great egg of chaos exist three moving agents which are the spirits of the world. The first, which is synonymous with the will of deity, is called Lu, or fate and is the driving power that moves all things to their predestined end. The second, wisdom, is Shang Ti, 
which is referred to as a horse upon which fate rides to the accomplishment of its ends. The third, activity, is called the body of Shang Ti and is ruled over by Puan Ku, the Demiurgus or Lord of the World, the Protagonist or First Man. Wherever matter is considered to be an eternal element and manifestation a periodic blossoming forth of the creative energies of this ever-existing state, we have the law of kulpas, or successive creations. In the Chinese system the yuan, kalpa, is considered analogous to the natural year, which therefore, becomes its symbol. As the year is divided into twelve periods, corresponding to the months and the signs of the zodiac, so the yuan is divided into twelve divisions called Y, each consisting of 10,800 years. The four seasons become symbolic of the four grand periods which correspond to the Hindu yugas, or divisions of life, birth, growth, maturity and decay, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Thus, in the period term spring cosmos comes forth into manifestation. During the summer the phenomena of growth and expansion take place, during the autumn the fruitage of effort is reaped, and during the winter the retirement of cosmos into its primordial nature is consummated. The spring of the world is symbolized by the color blue, the summer by red, the autumn by white and the winter by black. For great kings or regents, corresponding to the four Maharajas of the Brahmins, each painted the respective color of his season, rule over the cardinal angles of the heavens. In their midst sits the great yellow emperor the Brahman Mahat or intellect, the mind of the universe. The twelve signs of the zodiac are divided into groups of three to represent these seasons. The twelfth, first and second signs, which are to the north, form the winter season, with the first sign due north. The third, fourth and fifth signs, which are to the east, form the spring season, with the fourth sign due east. The sixth, seventh and eighth signs, which are to the south, form the summer season, with the seventh sign due south. The ninth, tenth and eleventh signs, which are to the west, form the autumn season, with the tenth sign due west. It is evident that this diagrammatic arrangement, which resembles a horoscope, is a figure by which may be estimated not only the duration of world periods, but of every order of creation, greater and lesser. Thus, the life of every atom is a culpa, likewise the life of man, the life of the race, the life of the planet, the life of the solar system, the life of the universe and the life of cosmos itself. As will be noted, Throughout all manifestation each of these kulpas is a fractional part, in turn, of a still greater one, until at last time which is their basis and indispensable to their existence is so merged into eternity as to be incapable of further differentiation. Every twenty-four hours the whole cycle is re-enacted in mortal time. The smallest kulpa may be but the fraction of a second's duration, while the greatest may endure for countless millenniums. While in time and magnitude these periods differ widely, still the diagram is a proper symbol of them all, for regardless of their magnitude all obey the same principle of periodicity and manifest the same general mathematical characteristics of form and progression. For example, the rotation of the earth upon its axis causes one of the twelve signs of the zodiac to rise sequentially every two hours upon the eastern horizon, so that the twelve complete their revolution in twenty-four hours and thus, make a minor culpa, or period. In its revolution around the sun the earth also passes through the twelve signs of the zodiac in twelve months, thus, constituting a greater culpa. Again, through the precession of the equinoxes the sun retrogrades through the twelve signs of the zodiac in approximately 25,000 years, which is therefore, called a great sidereal year and by which a still greater culpa is established. From such well-known illustrations we may gain some slight idea of the complexity of celestial dynamics as disclosed by the principle of culpas. In the first sign, which is due north, the Chinese universe had its genesis. The universal power, heaven, 
came into manifestation and a new day of wandering began. In the second sign the earth issued forth and in the third sign, which is the first of the spring months, Puan Ku appeared. This kulpa then continued and the generations came forth and through the spring, summer and autumn months lived, reached maturity and entered upon the inevitable decay. At last in the twelfth sign, which is the first of the winter months, came the great deluge, which marked the close of that kulpa. All living creatures were destroyed except Puan Ku, who is the undying or unchanging creature. After a period of rest the new kulpa was ushered in and Puan Ku in the third period came forth again to be the progenitor of human life. In this lesser reappearance, in which the kulpa of the earth rather than the universe is signified, the principle of Puan Ku became Fahi, the first emperor. It is said that the previous kulpa was destroyed because of its wickedness, but the archetypal man with his family, the eight diagrams of the Yiking, was preserved through the deluge to perpetuate creation. We are informed by the secret doctrine that Puan Ku is the sky man, or the monad of human generation. From Puan Ku descend upon threads, as in the Platonic system, a number of subordinate powers called by the Brahmins the Manus, or the first men. There are fourteen such Manus to a great kulpa and one comes forth at the beginning of each round, or day of manifestation, and also at the establishment of each root race. Thus, the Noah of the Jews is the Vaisvata Manu of the Brahmins. He is the undying man whose progeny gradually increases to the dignity of a race. In the present cycle Puan Ku, the eternal man, came forth in the form of Fahi, the Manu, to establish the new humanity. Hence Puan Ku is Adam and Fahi is Noah or the second Adam, who preserved the generations through the deluge which marked the close of a lesser kulpa. Fahi, while generally regarded as the first emperor of the imperial line, is really an avatar or incarnation of the grand man. His color is blue like that of Krishna and as Vishnu came forth at the beginning of his worlds in the form of a fish, so we are told that Fahi, the indigo emperor, had the body and tail of a fish. A similar philosophic basis exists for the legends of Dagon, Oans and the fish gods of antiquity, yes, even Jonah, who in the third sign, or period, was cast out of the whale's belly. An analysis of these various cosmological and theogonic systems shows the ancient pagan philosophers to have been unified in their concept of the principles by which the universe was called forth out of the abyss of absolute matter. Though the natural differences of terminology are obvious and though the allegories have taken on local color, still their common underlying truths are evident even to the uninitiated. These ancient sages have thus met the exact requirements prescribed by Socrates in the first Alcibiades for all instructors, namely, that they must agree together and not differ. That which men know is the basis of their agreement, that which they do not know is the cause of their disagreement. That sages, widely separated geographically and with diverse environments and temperaments, should arrive at the same general conclusions attests the accuracy of their findings. Being for the greater part superficial-minded, modern thinkers do not arrive at any such unanimity of agreement, but grope their way in a maze of contradictions which they impart to the young under the guise of education. Thus, in their frantic quest of the new or the spectacular, modern philosophers fabricate theories expressive more of the bizarre than of rationality. While all speculation regarding the infinite may be regarded as inconsequential when compared with the necessity of solving the problems of daily life, such rumination is essential to right perspective, for by it the mortal creature is raised from the state of some eyeless earthworm to the estate of a participator in the whole pageantry of universal procedure. In the past man has been oppressed by his own sense of inferiority. During the Dark Ages it was presumptuous to the point of heresy to speculate either upon the eternal laws by which he was governed, or the nature of that vast power which brooded over him and measured both his comings in and his going out. 
Today this bogey of fear persists only in a few isolated districts where the earthworm still wriggles in his native habitat, declaring that there is no sun because he cannot see it I the world is now coming to realize that thought is not heresy, but that not to think is to live in a concept of existence equivalent to the grossest blasphemy. There is nothing terrible or vengeful about the universe, nor does it turn disdainfully from the honest searcher into its mysteries. Creation stands forth unafraid and welcomes analysis of all its parts. It is said in holy writ that none shall look upon the God of Israel and live. But Israel's God was the Lord of another day and woe unto him who shall turn back from this new day to worship the irate gods of yesterday, for he shall perish from the narrowness of his own vision. The God of tomorrow stands forth in all its majesty of suns and moons and stars. Its extent is from space to space and eternity alone confines it. Man, gazing into the eyes of man, beholds therein his Maker. His Creator sings to him with the voice of the wilderness and descends upon him from the stars that spangle the heavens by night. This God is not hidden behind flowing draperies, nor are his ministers avenging angels. Unmoved by the passing of ages he contemplates the worlds that are his substance and through his own mind in man seeks to probe the depth of his own reality. This vast one has written his law in the heavens where they shall endure long after earthly codes have been erased from the memory of man. This God manifests his will in the endless progression and change by which things are moved from then to now and from now to then. This universal creator fears not man's effort to understand him, telescopes and microscopes may scan his features without offense. For what is the quest of knowledge but the God in man seeking the God in alii three God is, man is. Therefore, man is God and God is man. But before man may consciously enter into his divinity he must gaze upon himself in the all without fear and recognize himself in the all gazing back without hate. Steadfastly and unafraid, the rational soul thus, gazes upon those glorious beings whose radiant natures are that mystical light which is the life of the beholding soul. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.